All right, welcome to the 12 o'clock talk, track two, Diana Initiative 2022. We have Karishma, who's going to be giving her very first talk here at the Diana Initiative, Hacking Your Career. Miss Karishma, take it away. Awesome, thank you. Thank you guys for coming to my talk during lunch hour. I'm very excited <laughs> to be giving this. I must say that when I was in college, I went to my first cybersecurity conference. It was a small women-only conference in Seattle. And I remember sitting there thinking, I can't wait until one day I have something to talk about at one of these things. So the fact that I'm here today, this is me achieving a big goal for myself. And I'm glad you guys all get to be a part of it for me. Um, so if you're sitting here today, you are probably one of three people Either you are looking to pivot into the cybersecurity industry from somewhere else, or you are already in the cybersecurity industry, but you are looking to just pivot the kind of role that you have, or none of the above. And to you, I say thank you for coming. And I hope that by the end of my talk, I will have convinced you to think about your career trajectory a little bit differently. So again, I'm Karishma. Here's a few things about myself. First is I majored in computer science at a liberal arts school. A couple funny things here. I majored in computer science because my dad told me that if I did that, I could buy any pair of shoes that I wanted. And it was that easy to motivate me to, to do what he wanted me to do. And I went to a liberal arts school because that was the only school that gave me money. So if you, if you are seeing a trend here, uh, very financially driven. But overall, I think being a computer science major at a liberal arts school has afforded me the self-awareness and the emotional and social skills to be able to connect with a variety of audiences, both technical and non-technical. My first job out of college was being a penetration tester. I knew I wanted to work in security coming out of college. The reason for this is because the only female computer science professor at my school was a security professor and I became quite close with her. And so that's what I was looking to do after college. And then I underwent a large career pivot, which I will talk about more in depth today, in which I switched into product marketing. And that is where I sit right now. I am a product marketing manager at Datadog, working on their application security product. So why am I doing this talk? Well, essentially, when I was a penetration tester, I had a lot of people reach out to me saying, how can I break into pen testing, especially if I have a non-technical background? And I'm very excited that I can stand here today and tell you that I was able to see that they are now successful penetration testers. Also, when I moved into product marketing, I had a different cohort of people reach out to me. Now they were saying, how do I break out of my technical role and do more business-oriented type of roles? And so I wanted to put this talk together today to be able to say that there are a few ways you can think about your career pivots, and this is going to be one of them. So my goal overall is to answer these four questions for you. What is the hacker's methodology and why I'm even talking about hackers and career pivots in the same presentation? Two, why am I choosing to tell my career journey within, this, within the hacker's methodology or that framework? Three, how you can think about your own career pivots like a hacker. And four, just big picture overall, why are career pivots important, especially in the cybersecurity industry? So first, let's take a look at what the hacker's methodology is. The first stage is the reconnaissance phase. This is the information gathering phase. You want to essentially be able to gather as much data as you possibly can about the target with which you are trying to exploit. Now, the interesting thing is, you might think that when you are hacking or pen testing, that you would spend a lot of time developing the exploit, which is true, but you actually should spend more time gathering the information. You want your exploit to be as targeted and as informed as possible. And something else that I want to note here is you should think about reconnaissance as a very resourceful phase, right? You want to be looking around, trying to see as much as you can about something. A couple examples of how you can think about reconnaissance might be trying to see what ports are open and what services are running, 
or trying to see what kind of content management system your target application might be running on. The second phase is the exploitation phase. So this is when you want to look through everything that you found in the reconnaissance phase and say, okay, I think I found a few vulnerabilities. A couple of examples here might be saying, oh, I see that port 80 is open and that tends to be a very insecure port. Or saying, oh, I see that an older version of WordPress is running and public exploits are available that I can utilize. The third phase is the post-exploitation phase. Kind of funny that when you exploit something, now you have a post-exploitation phase. But the reason that this is here, right, because, is because once you are able to successfully exploit a vulnerability, you probably have something called local level privileges, which means that you have access to the host, but you can't do a whole lot with it yet. But you do now have access to more information. So this is pivoting you back to sort of that information gathering phase. And now you want to enumerate the host to be able to see what you can leverage to be able to ultimately escalate your privileges. So a couple of examples of what you could do here is trying to see, okay, do I have a vulnerable kernel version running? Or do I have any vulnerable third-party software running on this host? And then lastly, the most exciting part of the entire journey is privilege escalation, trying to be, be able to have either root or admin privileges and wreak as much havoc as you possibly can. So now that we've talked about what the hacker's methodology is overall, I'm going to talk about the story of my own journey within this framework. Now, I want to say that I'm sharing a very personal story with you guys, but it is important for me too because I hope that it will inspire others to think about their own career trajectories in a similar way. So again, uh, I was a computer science major, right? And so I had a software engineering internship my junior year. And I will say it was not my most favorite thing in the world. However, ironically, in my senior year of college, I still decided to apply for full-time software engineering roles. There's two reasons for that. The first reason being that I was trying to fulfill others' expectations of me. And the second reason is because, well, that's what everyone else in the major is doing. So I kind of just thought that's what I had to do with, with this degree. However, I want to take a moment here and say this slide is not about saying that you should or should not be a software engineer. In fact, I think if you're interested in it at all, I highly encourage you to go for it. However, what this is more about is my own personal journey and what a software engineer meant for me. And quite honestly, it was not the right fit. And so because my heart was not in it, I was having a hard time landing a full-time role, and I had to take a really good hard look at myself and understand what I bring to the table and what that meant for my next role moving forward. So this brings me to my own personal reconnaissance phase. This is a play on an Nmap scan. Basically, Nmap scans are what hackers use when they're doing information gathering to try and see which ports are open and what services are running on them. What you're seeing here are not ports, but traits and qualities and characteristics and whether they ring true for myself. I also would like to mention, as I talked about earlier, the reconnaissance phase takes a lot of time. Obviously, in one afternoon, you're not going to be able to completely figure out who you are and effectively describe yourself, right? This is a journey. This is a process. I was in college, a very turbulent time. So I was still trying to figure out who I was. But I want to mention something here, and that is that words create worlds. So I got super into personality tests and trying to just figure out what banks of words that I could pull from to be able to start describing myself. And I'll go through the first two examples here. First, you see it says interdisciplinary, right? So I went to a liberal arts school. I was taking classes in a variety of different disciplines. And I found myself gravitating towards wanting to explore intersections between subjects. For example, I was interested in trying to see which psychological theories I could apply to cybersecurity. For the second trait, likes working alone. Well, that is something I learned about myself being a software engineering intern. I was craving FaceTime. I was craving working with people, collaboration. And so with these various traits that rang true for me, I kind of found that I might potentially be well-suited for technical consulting. 
right? Because with consulting, you get to try a bunch of different projects, you get to present a lot to clients, and that sounded like something I wanted to do. And so with this, I pivoted from applying for software engineering roles to applying for my first consulting job at Accenture Security. And I was very interested in being a penetration test tester at Accenture. Quite honestly, I didn't ever think I could be one, but I saw that it was a possibility at Accenture, so I got very excited because being a penetration tester meant that I could continue growing my technical skills, but also be able to work very closely with clients and sharing all the various vulnerabilities which I found. So this is just a, a little snapshot of what my career looked like at this point. My software engineering days were sort of behind me. I was currently sitting as a penetration tester at Accenture Security, and I was enjoying it. I mean, when you go to a party and people ask you what you do and you say you're a hacker, it definitely sounds very cool. So <laughs> I, I enjoyed it. Um, but ultimately, at this point in my life, I saw myself as one day being a CEO. I do want to say I don't see that for myself anymore. I don't know if I want that anymore, but I did at this point. And so what that meant is I really was craving solving different kinds of challenges and problems. So after a few years of being a penetration tester, I started thinking, okay, what's a little bit more aligned to what I want to do? And I started looking at product, either product management or product marketing. And the reason for that is because when you work in product, you get to stay close to engineers and the technical side of things, but you also have to solve business problems, work a lot with customers, understand their needs, understand what they want, and understand the market at large. So what I did was apply for product marketing and product management roles, and I quickly ran into a lot of friction. And I think the reason for this is because if you looked at my resume at this point in time, I probably would be someone who wanted to get another pen testing role. I spent a lot of real estate on my resume talking about how many tools I knew and all the clients I served and the number of vulnerabilities and what percentage of them were critical. All that is great, right? I, people in product love people who come from a technical background, sure. But I was really not understanding all those various strengths and skills that I had to pull out in order to talk about myself effectively. So I had to pivot to my own personal post-exploitation phase, essentially coming back to that information gathering phase and trying to understand where I was at and what I could leverage for moving forward. And so the same idea when you are enumerating a host, right? You want to see what's available and how you can use that to either pivot laterally or escalate your privileges. And so for me, I had to enumerate my role. What does it mean really to be a penetration tester? If I talked about it at the surface level, I would probably say, yeah, I tested applications, found vulnerabilities, wrote reports, shared that with the client. But that doesn't really resonate with anyone who works in product. So if I thought about it a little bit more, right, what does it mean to share vulnerabilities with the client? Well, as a tester, my client tends to be developers, and developers are looking to ship code quickly. They are not looking to talk to me and have me tell them, oh, you need to go back to this code you've already shipped and rebuild it. So I had to do a lot of convincing or marketing. And then for the second thing that I had to do, training new testers, right? On the surface level, it's like, okay, cool. You have to train new testers. But I was training people who were coming from non-technical and technical backgrounds. I had to be able to effectively communicate technical concepts to them. And then lastly, Google Foo, kind of a funny little term that's used in the pen testing industry to basically mean you're really good at Googling, uh, very Google savvy, which is kind of funny that that's a desired trait these days, but it is, right? There's so, there's so much out there that you have to be able to understand how to efficiently spend your time combing through. So if I map this out to the verbiage of what a hiring manager for a product role would be looking for, I talked about how me having to convince developers to fix vulnerabilities meant I was good at storytelling, right? Because convincing people means that I need to motivate them. And motivation comes from them resonating. And resonating comes from storytelling. And then training new testers, right? Being able to communicate technical concepts to both 
technical and non-technical audiences is important in a business-oriented role because you are not going to just be speaking to those who are hands-on keyboard. And then lastly, being resourceful, right? In our world today, you need to be able to understand how to get various pieces of information and weave them together effectively in a business-oriented role. And I really, truly believed that my Google Foo helped me get there. So with all of this in mind, I looked a little bit more well-suited for product marketing. And I'm very excited to say that with, with this new way of positioning myself, I was able to land my first product marketing role at a cybersecurity company. And I will pause here and let everyone know that Defining product marketing is not the easiest thing. So if you are interested in it or just want to know what it even is, feel free to come find me after the talk or I will be throwing up my contact info at the end. Please feel free to reach out to me. I love talking about it. So now I want to turn to you guys. How can you all think about your own career pivots or your own career journey like a hacker? So for your own personal reconnaissance phase, what are your strengths and weaknesses? Now, I know this sounds obvious. You might hear this from any career coach. But what you're not going to hear from them is words create worlds. Take personality tests. Look out there. Do the research to figure out what is the language to be able to effectively communicate who you are. And I'm not talking about saying what you've done at your company, about who you are, what your essence is, what your brand is, what your personality is. And I think you should focus on both your strengths and your weaknesses. The reason for this is because we all have jobs, right? And then other people have jobs for the things that we're not good at. And you need to be able to showcase that you are going to be able to work well with those people who can do what you're not good at. And so I think it's really important to focus on that as well. Also, I want to encourage people to think about who they are outside of a professional or academic context. Who are you really when you're with a group of friends? For me, when I'm with a group of friends, I tend to be a little bit quieter. I'm a big listener. I like to piece together various perspectives that people have. That makes me a really good product marketer because I'm sitting at the intersection of various functions and my deliverables have to weave together per the perspectives of product management, of sales, of the customer. And so it's important to me that I do a lot of listening in my job. For your own exploitation phase, what can you leverage? What about yourself can you leverage? Now, for this, I did do a lot of LinkedIn informational interviews, and I have that as a piece of advice. But again, I know that sounds obvious. Everyone does informational interviews these days. But there is something that I think is not so obvious. When people reach out to me on LinkedIn, they tend to ask the question, how did you get to where you are? What was your journey like? How can I do that? And I think there is power in that question, but I don't think that it will give you the full answer of what you want, because there is no cookie cutter way to get from point A to point B. You guys are all coming from different contexts. You all have different personalities, different skills, different weaknesses. And so I think a better question would be, what about your personality do you think is the most well-suited to this role? What kinds of people do you interact with and what are those interactions like? What kinds of traits do you see surface up a lot when you are doing your day-to-day -day job? Focus on those kinds of questions that focus on the person, on the individual about what they bring to the table rather than their past experience and how you can emulate that. For the post-exploitation phase, so again, for the role that you want, you are probably already doing those things, just in a different way. And so I urge you to all think about your current role description and how you can talk about it in a way which will resonate with the language that the hiring managers of the role that you want use. I'll give a good example of, of when I was talking to a hiring manager who hires for offensive security roles. And he was telling me, he has a certain job description where he's like, okay, this is what a good offensive security person looks like. But he finds himself gravitating towards those who don't have that role description. And he was mentioning how his job description is someone who has a background in offensive security or red teaming, but he's really looking for software developers. And I asked, oh, well, 
why is that? And he said, well, if I have everybody who has the same background, no one's going to bring anything new to the table. And the reason that I look for software developers, which you might think is ironic, right? Because offensive security practitioners break software and software developers make software. But because software developers make software, they understand certain nuances, which those with just an offensive security background may not understand. And so with this, what I want to encourage all of you to do is find the power in where you are now, even if it's different, even if it's non-traditional, what are you bringing to the table that you see is a gap or that's missing uh, for the role that you're going for? And then lastly, the most exciting part, the privilege escalation, executing on the pivot. So we talked about mapping your current role description to your desired description. Again, words create worlds, be able to talk about yourself effectively, be able to understand the language of the desired role you're looking for. But also, you probably also don't have a lot of the skills and experiences for the role that you want. And that's totally fine. There's a lot of opportunity here to be able to build on that, especially in our world today when there's a lot of resources available. So a good example is let's say you've got two people, right? Person A and person B. Person A is a, is a pen tester who's looking to be a content marketer and person B is a content marketer who's looking to be a pen tester. Both of these people have an opportunity here to start a blog about pen testing, right? The content marketer has the writing chops and they can use the blog to be able to learn pen testing and show that they understand the concepts. And then for the pen tester, they have the pen testing chops. So, you know, it'd be good for them to write about it, but then be able to start a blog to grow those skills and show that they have the skills and show that they have what it takes to be a content marketer. So now I wanna kind of take a step back and talk about why career pivots are important in the cybersecurity industry. So here's a quote by Jeff Belknap, the CISO of LinkedIn. And he says, I want English majors and chemists and economics experts who can come together to help solve these hard problems, each bringing their unique training, diversity of thought and ways to approach problems into the mix. So the context of this quote essentially was when you are in the cybersecurity industry, you are working to protect a lot of people who are doing a lot of different things, right? And so within the industry, it's important to not only have the specialists with the deep industry knowledge who've been in here a long time, but also the generalists, right? And this is something that's really close to my heart because I'm someone who's been more of a generalist than a specialist, and it's made me very insecure to, to feel like I'm not really good at any one thing. But I've learned over time that there's a lot of power in the generalists, that they are bringing in perspectives and helping us think outside of the ways that things have always been done. And so with this, I want to finish up by saying that I urge all of you to think about your own career trajectories. And if you are someone who wants to explore breadth over depth, I urge you to lean into it. Don't be afraid of it, especially because not only will it make you a better cybersecurity practitioner, but it will make the industry much better overall. I also, shameless plug, if anyone's looking to pivot into a career at Datadog to come find me after the presentation or reach out to me, I would be happy to talk about any, opening, any open roles or connect you with the right people. And with that, I thank you all for coming to my talk. Are there any questions? Thank do you, you. Do you mind walking up to the mic to ask your question right there, front and center? Beautiful. Thank you. What was the uh, like the elapsed time between you know your role initially from when you graduated to pen tester to where you are now? Good question. Uh, so I graduated in 2018. I was a pen tester from 2018 to 2021, and then I've been in product marketing since then. So very quick pivots. <laughs> Anybody else? Are these pivots in the same company? 
No, so I was a pen tester at Accenture, and then I was a product marketer at CyberReason for a year, and now I'm a product marketer at Datadog. And it's not only been pivots within companies, but also types of security companies, right? So Accenture is more so the consulting side of things, services oriented, CyberReason is in the EDR space, and the EDR space is highly competitive. So being a product marketer there meant something different to where I am today, which is Datadog, which is not, it is not originally a cybersecurity company, but it's trying to enter those markets. So then that comes with its own host of uh, challenges and responsibilities. Good question. Thank you.